All right, so we're ready to, ready to start the third day of Real World Crypto. And our first session today is on wireless protocol security. And our first speaker is David Basin, who's going to talk about 5G security. So David, all yours. Thank you. So I need a clicker. Is this the, uh, is this the right one? Somebody took the clicker. I'd love to give a talk, but we need, who took the clicker? Did you take it? OK. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about work on model checking 5G security. This will actually be a talk within a talk. The Outer talk will be on the importance of formal methods, in particular model checking for security protocols. And I'll introduce some techniques that may be new for some of you that I think can be very important for the real world crypto community. The talk inside the talk will be an application of these techniques to 5G and the security standard within 5G. The work I'm talking about is a large collaboration it involves different teams, also in international across countries. One is the team of researchers who have worked together with me on the Tamarin project. Um, and I list them here. Um, Tamarin is a model checker, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. And it's been under development for over eight years. The second team which I'll talk about, and there's some overlaps, are those who have worked with me on the 5G, on modeling and reasoning about the 5G specification. 5G is a huge specification we took a number of years to follow the formalization of that, and that also took a fair amount of manpower. So um, a big thanks to those people who worked with me. Also, I'd just like to mention that for some of the slides on Tamarin, I'd like to thank Kaz, because uh, they're slides that I bought, borrowed from him. Um, let's begin with security protocols and the need for formal methods. This isn't 5G. This is from the Internet Key Exchange. It's one of the phases. It's one of the modes. Um, the details don't matter. You don't need to understand it. Um, but I just point out a few features. For example, we have keys that are being used for encryption, and these keys are being derived from various other keys. So there's a key, and then there's a deriving key, then an authentication key, an encryption key, et cetera. So we have all these nested hashes. And you might ask yourself, clicker. OK, there we go. Uh, we might ask ourselves, why all of these nested hashes? And, well, there are good practices, and one good practice is you use different keys from different things, so you begin by deriving a lot of keys. Then if you look carefully, you might see, for example, that these Diffie-Hellman uh, public keys, these G to the X, G to the Ys, are sometimes written in another order, and these cookies against denial of service are sometimes also changed. And you might ask yourself, does argument order matter? And there might be some people in the audience who would say, yes, it's a good idea to change the order of things, because this will prevent certain types of attacks, like reflection attacks, where you play a message back to a party, and he accepts it in a different step. I would argue these are not the questions we should be asking. The fundamental question we should ask are, what does this protocol actually do? What does this protocol actually achieve? And in what environment, so our environments have adversaries, so against what adversary does it have the properties we would like? These are the real questions, not these questions that somehow motivate best practices about how to organize protocols. Um, but nevertheless, protocol design today is typically approached as an art. There are these best practices. There are committees within the IETF, W3C, and other organizations that build protocols. They often have to reuse existing protocols. And the whole thing reminds me a little bit of the following story. Some of you may know it. So I have here a picture of a roast that's a big piece of meat. And the story goes as follows. When I made a roast, I always started by cutting off the ends, just like my grandmother did. Someone once asked me why I did it, and I realized I had no idea. It never even occurred to me to wonder. It's just the way it was done. Eventually, I asked my grandmother, grandmother, why do you cut the ends off of a roast? And she answered, because my pan is small, and otherwise the roast would not fit. So this is, to some extent, how I see how I think protocols are being designed. We have these best practices. We carry things out. Sometimes we don't even question why. Um, the alternative would be protocol design as a science, and here I mean in the root sense of the word science. So that is discovering and knowing something that you can demonstrate and verify within a larger community. And formal methods is one way of doing this. It's a way to build better pro protocols where we have very precise specifications of the system, 
so the protocol of the environment, i.e. the adversary which, with which it interacts, and also the properties. And if we do this well, and we have supporting tools, then we can debug, verify, and explore alternatives. And I'm happy to say that there's been a lot of progress over the last 20 plus years in formal methods for security protocols, and tools have advanced to the point where we can apply these protocols with reasonable effort to protocols that really matter. And here I've listed in yellow some of the protocols that uh, my team has worked on, so protocols for entity authentication, 5G. I'll be talking about that today. There was some great work at Oxford with Cas, uh, Cas Kramers on TLS 1.3. Um, and this is very exciting. And slowly, companies are becoming tool users. I hope by giving such a talk, I might motivate those of you who come from industry to consider whether such tools might help you in your work. So where is the difficulty? I mean, the problems are not easy. Um, it's not just like you snap a finger and you verify a protocol. So this is kind of a standard picture from Verification 101. What we do is we have a specification of the system that's sometimes called the model because you're making a model of the system at some level of abstraction. And you'd like to show that it satisfies certain properties. Um, and why is this difficult to do? Well, for security protocols, we have to first specify how the system operates. And if you look at a typical standard, whether it's a, an a IETF standard, some other standard, often you have the problem that before formalization comes, you must be precise. And protocol design documents are often incomplete and imprecise. Um, often it's unclear what the adversary model even is. So protocols are given without adversary models, or there are statements like this protocol should not be subject to replay attacks. And that's like saying this program should not suffer from a buffer overflow. Yes, that's true, but it doesn't tell you what the program actually does. Um, another problem is uh, from the security properties, what shall be achieved? And here properties are often implicit or imprecise. So example, authenticate. What does authenticate really mean? There are various ways you can make that precise. And finally, of course, the notion of satisfaction. Does the system meet its, its requirements? Um, here, ideally, we have proof, and in the best possible case, machine checked proof, because humans can get lazy or make mistakes. And here we're up against undecidability, so I'll be talking about verification as a symbolic model, and here even for very simple classes of protocols, basic properties like as a key a secret is undecidable. And even if you restrict yourself to restricted cases where you can only have, for example, finitely many interleaved runs of a protocol, you still have a prob uh, an, an intractable problem. So the weapon of choice that uh, we've been working on that I'll tell you a little bit about is Tamarin. So Tamarin is not an acronym, it's actually a monkey, kind of a cute monkey. Um, and Tamarin is basically, our Tamarin is basically a constraint solver that sol sol solves constraints about what the adversary could do in a particular situation. And then we turn that constraint solver into a theorem prover. So it's a constraint solver disguised as a theorem prover. Um, I'll say a little bit about what Tamarin does. I won't say um, really how it works. I won't talk about the algorithmic background to it. That would be a different talk for a different community. But I'll just tell you a little bit about how you might use such a model checker, and then we'll move to 5G. Um, so as is often the case in model checking, you have the specification of the system. This uh, doesn't work all that well. The specification of your system, that's called your model. You have the property. You negate your property, and you would like to have a behavior that's consistent with the system. So it's a system behavior that falsifies your, pro your property. And in our case with Tamarin, we use constraint solving to find that. And if we find such a behavior that's an attack, and uh, we get a representation of it, you could present that to the user, for example, as a message sequence chart, if you would like. And importantly, um, if the constraints are inconsistent, then no possible attack can exist. And this means no matter how you interleave runs of the protocol, arbitrarily many runs, with the adversary, there cannot be an attack. And that constitutes a proof. Um, of course, since the underlying problems are undecidable, you might run out of time, memory, patience, etc. And then Tamarin allows you to go into an interactive mode where you can work with this theorem prover constraint solver to interactively construct a proof or to provide hints, so sometimes you need auxiliary invariants, uh, or even possibly change the underlying proof strategy being used. That's called oracles. Okay, how do you actually use this in practice? Um, so protocols are specified using a specification language called multi-set rewriting. Uh, multi-set rewriting is a little bit like term rewriting for those of you who know it, but rather than changing one term to another, you change a multi-set, which you can think of as a bag of facts, into another bag of facts. And these bag of facts 
represent the states of the different protocol participants. Think of them as each having a little protocol automata. So what state are they in? What do they know? And also, for example, the state of the network, which might contain information on messages being sent out, received, what the adversary knows, et cetera. So here's a little example. So in multi-state rewriting, our rules transform a left-hand side to a right-hand side, and it can also be labeled with actions. These are, it gives rise to a labeled rewriting system, a labeled transition system. So there's a typical example of a rule. The left-hand side says, if um, we have input to our network, so in represents input to the network of some k, think of it as a key, and um, in our multi-set, um, some uh, um, protocol automata with some thread ID, thread ID is in some step, is in its first step, then in that case, our protocol would say, well, advance your step to step two and output on the network an acknowledgement and also in your state record that you receive this key K. Okay, so this would represent a transition from taking input off the network to recording it and outputting a response. And this would be labeled with um, I thread ID have accepted K, say, as a key. So this gives rise to a transition system with a trace semantics. So now imagine we have a state of our system that's this bag, this multi-set of facts. In this multi-set, we have many facts, but among them are that um, key is input to the network and some thread ID three is in step one. Then we can match that with the left-hand side of this rule. So key would be instantiated, K would be instantiated with key, thread ID would be instantiated with TID three, et cetera. Then this rule would say we can take these facts out and replace them with instantiated right-hand side of the rule. So we match the left-hand side, we replace it with instantiated right-hand side. So we get a new state with ACK output on the network, and this thread ID has advanced its state and recorded that it's gotten the key. Moreover, this transition is labeled. That thread ID has accepted the key. And this gives rise to a label transition. And you can continue this because you'll have other rules available, and you get a trace, which is a sequence of transitions, and in particular the trace, we end up, what we understand by a trace, the trace semantics, is the sequence of these red parts here. And that trace is important because we specify properties over traces. So we can say, for example, somebody has accepted a key and the adversary doesn't know it. That might be something that we would specify. Okay, that may be a security property. So I showed you an example of a rule and in general, in protocols, you'll have multiple rules. So for example, you'll have multiple roles, and each role will have a role automata. There might be an initiator role, a responder role, a key server role. This would be an example of the role automata for the client state machine for TLS 1.3. And here, for each of these arrows here, we would have a multi-set rewriting rule, okay? So in general, you'll have quite a lot of multi-set rewriting rules for complicated protocols. We also have to specify our adversary. So for our adversary, we want a network adversary who's active. Sometimes this is called a Dole of Yao adversary, historically, at least in the symbolic setting. Um, but as cryptographers here know, um, a network adversary you know, seems strong. They see everything. They can, they can interfere. But actually, we want to consider even stronger adversaries who can, for example, corrupt long-term secrets, corrupt your random number generator, corrupt session state. So this would correspond to different oracles in the computational setting. So here's an example of how you might um, specify session reveal. Um, uh, 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 excuse me, right. So you could specify th these adversary ca capabilities also by um, uh, multi-set rewriting rules. So here's how you would specify a session reveal. So if there is a state where some thread ID has learned a key, then that key can be output to the adversary, and that transition will be labeled with um, thread ID's uh, key has been uh, revealed to the adversary. Okay, so again, so we, we, spe we have rules for all the different protocol automata, and we can also have rules for the behavior of the attacker. Uh, now the question is, how do we specify properties? Uh, the properties themselves are specified in a guarded fragment of first-order logic with time points. Um, it's essentially morally like a past-time first-order temporal logic. You can say if something has happened, then something can happen before or um, at other points in the trace. So, here is an example of how you might specify that a key is secret. Um, it would be for all thread IDs, for all keys. It's a two-sorted logic, so one of the sources over time points for all time points i. Um, if a thread ID TID has accepted a key at time point i, then there isn't another time point j where the adversary knows the key. So k here means the adversary has learned the key at time point j. Okay, so in this way we can specify properties, and a property will hold if all possible traces of the protocol satisfy that property. Okay, so you specify good properties, 
And then you want to see if when you negate them, you can find traces that violate the properties. That's how model checking works. And again, these are interpreted over the red bits, over the traces. Okay, then at the end of the day, there's a question of, well, what does Tamarin really do? What's the magic of Tamarin? So Tamarin takes these specifications of the role automata, of the adversary, of the security properties, and then it uses various constraint-solving algorithms, which I will not go into, which I will not describe further, to try and see if there is a way that the different protocol automata can somehow be run together with the adversary to attack the protocol. And if it's not the case, then we will have a proof that no possible attack can exist at all. So let me now move from Tamarin, that was kind of a quick um, high-level bluffer's guide to what a model checker might do, to uh, analyzing 5G. Um, here I'm gonna use my phone as a little prop. So 5G, of course, as you know, is the new um, uh, standard for, for um, wireless communication. It's standardized by the 3GPP. Um, the, the first full release of it, um, at least the, the first um, uh, full relief release of the basic um, 5G protocol um, was last year, June 14th, 2018. This is a protocol that is gonna have massive uptake. So right now, most of you are using 4G, so LTE, maybe in some places of the world, even 3G. But for current cell cellular services, we have about five billion mobile subscribers, and we can expect that and more for 5G, because 5G will also be used to enable the Internet of Things and things like this. Um, and you can expect that a large portion of the world's population will eventually have 5G access. So the question is, okay, very good. This is a protocol, it's used for communication. Communication is critical, how is it secured? And there are various um, parts of it that are security relevant. And here I'll be talking about AKA authentication and key agreement. And what I'll be, be describing here, you can find more about in a CCS paper. Um, so how does authentication and key agreement work within 5G? So the idea is we have user equipment, there's a bunch of acronyms here, so the UE, the user equipment, which has a SIM, now called a USIM, a Universal Subscriber Identity Module. Um, I want to be able to use this for, for telephone calls. And so I am Swiss and I have a phone registered in Switzerland with Swisscom, so Swisscom is my home network, and I come here in New York, and according to my phone, my, phone, my serving network is T-Mobile. So I don't have any security association with T-Mobile, but I have them with my home network. I would like to set up an association and a secure channel with a serving network. And 5G AKA is about how, how you do that, how the subscriber and the serving network authenticate each other and set up a key, okay? Now, of course, in security, you typically uh, don't get security from nothing, so we have some setup assumptions. Uh, namely that uh, on my USIM, uh, uh, my, my user subscript, my my uh, user equipment in the home network will share a symmetric key. Um, it will, I'll have a permanent identifier called the SUP. We also had SUPs in previous versions of 5G, like 4G. That's a subscriber permanent identifier. The SUP is privacy relevant. Um, and in 4G, there were problems with IMC catchers because as you go around, say, New York, um, your phone is often uh, transmitting your SUP. So you can, you can uh, hear that at various places if you're, if you're listening for it, and you can track me as I go through New York. So in 5G, they said, we want to get that right, so we're going to conceal the SUPI in something called a SUKI. We're gonna see that later. Um, so the SUPI will be used to derive a SUKI, and that'll be derived in a randomized way such that that changes, so presumably I cannot be traced as I go through New York. There's also a sequence number, so it's a sequence number-based protocol, and uh, uh, I will also, my user equipment will also have the public key of the home network. Okay, so that's the setup. Um, let's look at how the protocol works. I will give you the main ideas. I won't go into through every little micro step because there's a lot of detail here, but I'd like to give you the, the main idea of how it works. Um, first, I will send to the serving network, say here in New York, um, my SUPI, but I will mask it, I will encrypt it uh, using the home network's public key. So here, this is just my terminology for asymmetric encryption. It's randomized using some random value that I generate. It's encrypted with the public key of the home network. And I tell the serving network also what is the identity of the home network. Okay, so here I have a little message sequence chart. Um, this shows the little setup assumptions, who knows what. And I'm going to send the SU key from the subscriber to the serving network. And then the serving network now knows who the home network is. So it says, I am the serving network and here is the SU key. Uh, and then the home network can choose an authentication method. There are several, and I will tell you about AKA. 
And here on this slide, I have the successful case of AKA, and I'll also show you a couple failure modes. And again, I don't want to explain every little line of this, but I still want to give you the main ideas. So it's a, a kind of a challenge response protocol where the home network will generate a random number. Um, now, just so you know, these various Fs are keyed, um, uh, uh, keyed one-way functions. Uh, and there are also various other one-way functions, such as challenge and the like, and key seed, which is used for key derivation function. Some of these have slightly different properties, but I won't go into those details for now. Um, so uh, what, what, would we, what we do here is we use this uh, shared key, shared with the subscriber, um, to make a MAC of the home network sequence number and also this random value. And then we uh, use another one-way function uh, with, to, uh, with this random value and the key to produce uh, a random string, and this random string will be used as a one-way function to conceal, excuse me, excuse me a one-time pad, effectively, uh, to conceal the, the uh, home network sequence number, so we don't want to send sequence numbers in the, in the clear. And the pair of this, so this uh, encrypted sequence number in the MAC is called Aten, that will be sent over and then unpacked on the other side. And then we calculate various responses that the different parties can expect. Uh, and then from all of this data, this key, the randomness and the sequence number and the, the, the serving network's name, we generate a key seed, and this will be used eventually by the serving network and the subscriber to derive a common shared key, and we increment our counter for the home network. Okay, this various data then is sent, um, this is a secure channel between the home network and the serving network, so the randomness, this authentication information, an expected response, and this key seed function for deriving a key. Um, then the randomness in this authentication information is sent over to the subscriber. And what does the subscriber do? Um, it, first of all, it unpacks the information. Then it generates this one-time pad itself because it's given the randomness and it has a shared key. Uh, then it generates um, what it believes to be the sequence number for the home network. Then it can also compute, actually I have little explanations here. Um, then it can also compute the MAC itself with this data that it generated and has. And then it performs two checks. Um, and these checks are important. The first check it does is that the MAC it calculated is the same as the MAC it received. So in other words, it checks the authenticity of the information it got over the air, because the communication between the server and the subscriber is over the air. So it checks that it got something authentic, that uh, this was authentically generated by the home network. And then it checks recentness. It checks the... Um, its sequence number of the user equipment, it shouldn't be greater than the sequence number of the home network, as otherwise we would have a replay attack. So it's important to remember these two checks, um, uh, authenticity and freshness. If both of the checks succeed, then there are some steps where uh, it updates its sequence number to that of the home network, it computes a response, it can compute now this key seed, um, um, uh, because it has all of the data that the home network um, used for this key seed, so it can compute the same key seed. Uh, so it and the serving network can later on derive a common key. It sends the response uh, to, the, to the serving network, who checks that it's legitimate. And if it's legitimate, it sends it to the home network, and the home network also checks that everything is legitimate. And if everything succeeds, so here we had the serving network sending the soup key to the home network, and the home network says, I now give you, the serving network, the soup P, so you know really which subscriber you're talking to. Because until then, um, the serving network hasn't authenticated the subscriber, it just has a SUP key, which is a pseudonym, but now it really has a SUP P. Um, so it can use that for billing and for other functions. Okay, there are two failure cases. Uh, the first thing we saw is that there's a failure mode where the MAC checks, so that's I, the MAC checks, but the counter but, the, but the, the message is not recent. Um, we have a problem with checking the counter. This would happen when a message is being replayed. Now, if that's the case, then we have to synchronize. Um, and this is a problem with, with protocols involving counters. You have to effectively send your counter to the home network. Um, so, the counter can re, so the home network can resynchronize its counter. So uh, to do that, what you do is, again, uh, you want to take your sequence number. You want to one-time pad it, so you have to generate padding information. And then you can pack that together and send information on the synchronization to the home network. Now, an important thing for you to remember is that this synchronization um, information is sent when there is a MAC failure, and it's sent with information that only the subscriber can generate because it depends on the subscriber's key. 
So please keep that in mind. Um, so uh, this was the case that we had. We have to resynchronize. Um, whoops. And then the second failure is when there's a Mac failure, and we simply send an error message that there's a Mac failure and the protocol aborts. Okay, so that was a high-level view of how the protocol works. This is the type of thing that um, uh, what I've described here is actually spread out over 722 pages in, in 3GPP documentation. But now we can ask ourselves the question of, is the protocol secure? So stepping back and model checking, first we make things precise, and after we made things precise, we have a precise understanding, we can make things formal and check. So here are questions you might ask. Is the home network talking to a subscriber, talking to user equipment with a valid use sim, or to an imposture? Um, privacy. So 4G had the problem with MC catchers, but am I traceable as I roam through New York? And if so, um, how would that work? So here we use Tamarin, but I have to say verification was really challenging. Um, often it's the case where we have problems from practice and we're not ready to handle them at some point in time. This motivates a lot of work. So in particular, um, it's a challenging protocol because it has state, it has sequence numbers. Um, the state is fairly complicated. Uh, it uses XORs and operators, so we have to be able to, to adequately model different cryptographic operators, and XOR is fairly difficult to handle. We, we, we formalize that equationally, and it makes it very difficult to integrate. XOR is very difficult to integrate into our constraint solvers. Our constraint solvers work well with something which is called subterm convergent theories, and this isn't one of them, so we had to go off and develop um, a theoretical basis for integrating XOR. Um, privacy requirements are also quite tricky, so to see if you're being tracked. Those are not trace properties, they're hyper properties, they're two hyper properties. So you formalize privacy typically by observational equivalence, and that's not a trace property. For those of you who know about things like hyper properties, it's a hyper property. And that required extending our tool not just to verify protocols with respect to trace properties, but also observational equivalence. And of course, there can be unboundedly many sessions that are interleaved. So this required a lot of work, and we were able to use some very recent Tamarin extensions. Um, which are published in other papers, for example, observational equivalence and XOR. Okay, so how did the formal analysis work? Um, we formalized draft uh, 1.0 of the standard, um, and this required following the standardization body for about a year, building base models and augmenting them with their different changes, so, so keeping up with them. And this is a methodology that seems to work fairly well. For example, the Oxford team with uh, Cass Kramers did this uh, for for TLS 1.3, and you can really, you know, as verification engineers, so to speak, follow standardization committees and give them feedback. Um, we had to work with the documents of the 3GPP, and that was over 722 pages of documents, and it required a little bit of interaction to make things precise to understand them. Um, the Tamarin model for the protocol was 500 lines of multi-set rewriting rules. Um, the specification of the desired goals plus some additional lemmas which were needed to make the, the um, uh, the verifier terminate uh, was over was roughly around a thousand lines with 124 lemmas. Um, so the specification didn't really it wasn't very clear about the adversary. So what we often do with Tamarin is if you don't tell us the adversary, we'll figure it out for you. Namely, we'll first verify the, the protocol with a fairly weak network adversary, and then we'll add different compromise capabilities. You can actually have a partial order of adversaries. We'll try and find the strongest adversaries under which the properties hold. Um, and said another way, we try and find out what compromise capabilities break the protocol. Okay, so that also took a bit of work to find the strongest adversary models, and um, it was computationally intensive. Um, doing a verification would take over five hours. Okay, what did we find out? For authentication, so what properties should hold? Well, the standard itself specifies surprisingly few and weak authentication goals. So we had to guess for ourselves what authentication goals should hold. And certainly what's important is that the subscribers uh, and the serving network, so, so here I am using a serving network in New York, we agree on a session key. So we have authenticated key, a key agreement. I know who the serving network is, they know who I am, and we have a common view of the key. That wasn't explicitly stated, but when you state that, it actually fails. And it fails for kind of a tr trivial reason um, that's um, actually pretty embarrassing. Namely, the last message sent from the home network to the serving network, where the, here the SUKI is sent and then the SUPI is sent, doesn't bind the SUPI to anything at all. So um, in, a, in a world where interleave messages are possible, it's possible for the serving network to get the wrong SUPI. 
Um, and if this were to occur, this would be a real problem. It could result in billing the wrong subscriber for services. Um, what's interesting is the previous version of the standard did not have this flaw. Earlier versions did not have this flaw, but at some point somebody just left out some message and this very simple mistake came into the standard. So protocols can help you with simple mistakes. They can also help you with very subtle mistakes. Here was a case of catching a simple mistake. It's almost like type checking. This type of stuff shouldn't happen. Um, there are a number of other problems which you could debate if they're really problems or not. Uh, the standard aims at only implicit authentication. So implicit authentication is, well, we, we have agreement on the key and we know he, who each other are, but only after the key is used. Um, so whether or not that's good or not depends on how the protocol will be composed with other protocols. If it's always going to be, be composed with other protocols in the future where you use the key before you rely on knowing who the partner is, then that's okay. Otherwise, it's not okay. Um, I would argue you should always try and have explicit authentication. And it turns out it's very easy to get in this protocol with very minor modifications, no additional cryptography. So I would argue that that's an improvement, but whether it's an improvement or not depends on how you actually plan to use the protocol. Um, what's also interesting is, secu is um, security and privacy. So here are some good things. The session key is secret, assuming there are no corrupted long-term keys, which uh, I think is a fine assumption, and you have a secure channel between the serving network and the home network. Um, there is no weak forward secrecy for the key seed function, but you wouldn't expect it because it's a symmetric key cryptogra uh, uh, protocol, so that's okay. Um, the long-term key will remain secret when running the protocol, so this is all fine. Um, but there's something which wasn't fine, and this was a real shock. Um, the SUP remains secret, so this common MC catcher attack won't work, um, assuming no corrupted SN or um, serving network or home network. But and this was really surprising, that wasn't sufficient to ensure untraceability. So please remember the first failure mode when the MAC was correct, but a message was replayed. So you have an active adversary who replays, a, uh, who hears a message from the serving network to my user equipment and can later replay it, then I will always um, have a response that you can identify and you can associate with me because only I can produce it and that can be seen by an external party. I will always give the same response where I, re where I resynchronize the, the, um, the sequence number, and this is a response that only I can give. So by looking at the response that I give in this failure mode, you can actually track me as I go through New York and as I go through the world. Okay, so the problem is, so they got right the fact that the SUPI isn't being sent in the clear, but the error messages are actually enough to trace subscribers. And this is, this is a shock, right? This is one of the... Um, features of 5G is that it should have improved um, anonymity pro properties, privacy properties, and this absolutely fails. And unlike the previous issues that, that I mentioned, there is no easy fix to this, to this problem. So the current version of 5G has this problem. And there are still ongoing discussions. It's, it's not clear yet how to fix this. Um, so one of the nice things with working on formal methods is you can find attacks. The attacks are real. The attacks matter. It generated a fair amount of media. Here I have just some of the media in English, in German, uh, in French, etc. cetera. Um, I had lots of interesting calls with um, uh, handset manufacturers and the like. The ideas that I mentioned are very general. I focused here on 5G, the story within the story, but the, the outer story is you can really use this for many protocols that matter. Here are some examples of the types of things that we can analyze, in fact, rather easily with, with the Tamarind tool. Let me draw some conclusions for the outer story, art versus science. I think we can improve the way protocols are built, understood, and analyzed. Um, in particular, the community has come a long way, the formal methods community. 20 years ago, we were doing very simple Alice and Bob exchange a key. Now we can handle protocols at the scale of uh, TLS 1.3 and 5G. And I think standardization efforts should really be doing this. They should be following the development of their protocols using these tools either themselves or um, uh, together in collaboration with groups that, that, uh, that, that enjoy working with formal methods. Uh, doing so is good hygiene. It forces you to be explicit about your protocol, your adversary, and your property. As I indicated, you can find errors or produce proofs, um, and that this is really a realistic um, effort to do. Of course, the game isn't completely, completely won. Um, we're always up against the problem of complexity, complexity, complexity. The underlying problems are still undecidable. 
Um, it's always a question of how we improve the scope of our protocol, of our, of our tools, what kinds of protocols can we model, and how accurately, how faithfully we can model them. And finally, an important point, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, is education. I think it's very important to get the message out, to let engineers know you can use these tools and to work together in training engineers. Thank you. Fantastic. So we have maybe time for one question. Okay. Uh, so I am one of the users of Tamarind Prover. Great. And uh, you said about different kinds of adversary. So how, how can you modify the capability of Dolib Yao? So, so I gave you an example of session state reveal. You just add rules, right? We, so so, so you, we, we add rules yes. for that. Okay. Because I, I, was, I was trying to uh, have a wiki he, Diffie Hellman model. And yeah, so for Diffie Hellman, you would want to have perfect forward secrecy. Perfect forward secrecy is just secrecy where you have a long term key reveal. And a long term key reveal could be formalized as a rule that after a session key has been established, the long term key can be output to the network. Okay. Thank you. So sure. Actually, I have to ask. So now that you've done the work to uh, formalize the protocol in 500 lines, can we just throw away those 700 pages and just use your 500 lines to understand the protocol? Um, I, th I would say you should use both together. So, so the, seven, the 722 lines uh, contain additional pages. things, for example, uh, uh, pages, thank you, contain additional things, for example, data type definitions. So, so you know, how big are strings and things like this. There's some justification arguments for things. Um, you get some history reference to other standards, so I think you need both. So I think that, that uh, informal or semi-formal documentation should be complemented with formal models. Uh -huh. And also, I have to ask, does, does this model denial of service attacks too? Um, that that, that's not in the scope of this model, and we would have to discuss what, what we mean. So, I mean, you can do some kinds of analysis of denial of, ser of, of service, like say, can they get you to perform, can the adversary get you to a point in the protocol to perform expensive cryptographic operations? You can analyze those types of things with these tools, but that wasn't here. Awesome. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. thank you, David. Yes. Sure. Okay, that was a fantastic talk, and I, I guess we're going to move on to another wireless protocol, WPA3, which was actually not on the list of protocols analyzed, uh, and so we're going to hear about drug, dragon blood and attacks on WPA3. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. So I will be talking about Dragonfly and how it is used in WP3 and EPWD. So I am Mati Van Oof and uh, I did this work together with E.L. Ronan, Ronan who will do the second half of this talk. So let's first do a very quick introduction. This is all related to Wi-Fi security and if you look at the history, we first had web, which is quite horribly broken. In response, they defined uh, WPA based on a draft of the IEEE standard. And finally, we have the latest IEEE standard of WPA2. But WPA2 is vulnerable to offline uh, dictionary attacks. And recently, there were also key reinstallation attacks against it. And in response to all this, they uh, recently standardized WPA3. And they decided to use the so-called Dragonfly handshake. And the Dragonfly handshake is what we call a PAIC, meaning it does authentication based on a password. And Dragonfly previously was also used in the EPWD protocol. And this is a protocol you use in certain, in a low amount of enterprise networks where you authenticate using a username on a password. And this handshake provides the usual properties. You have mutual authentication, you negotiate a session key. But the more important thing is this does uh, defend against offline dictionary attacks in contrast to WPA2. So how does the protocol work? Well, let's say we have a client here that wants to connect to an access point. Then the first thing that needs to happen is that both parties need to convert their shared password, which is, for example, in ASCII or Unicode. They need to convert it to a group element P, and this element can then be used in the actual cryptographic calculations. And once this is done, uh, the handshake can execute the actual uh, first phase of the messages. And this is called the commit phase. And 
To simplify it, the commit phase essentially negotiates a new session key. And in the second phase of the handshake, we have the confirm phrase, and at the high level, this confirms that both peers negotiated the same key, and they prove to each other that they indeed possess uh, the same password. But the big question here is, how is the password converted uh, to this group element P? And here, the first remark is that the handshake can operate using both mod P crypto groups and elliptic curves, but we will focus on elliptic curves here. So the question becomes, how can we convert a password into a point on the elliptic curve? So this is often called a hash to curve algorithm, and how can you do this? Well, a naive way would be to take uh, the shared password and to combine it with the MAC addresses of the client uh, and the access point. And we can then take the resulting output from the hash function and interpret it as the X coordinate of the point on the curve. Now there's one problem here, and this is that not all X coordinates are actually on the curve because some of them do not have a corresponding Y value. In fact, half of the X values um, do not have a solution here for the Y coordinate. So that's a problem. So how did they decide to handle this? Well, they decided to add an uh, if test here where they, where they first check, does this square root have a solution? And if not, they will execute extra iterations and they will include the counter into the hash function here that calculates the X coordinate. This means that in every new iteration, we get a new uh, point X on the curve. So probably quite of you already see the problem here. The problem is the password now, the, uh, the number of iterations now depends on the password being used. And it also depends on the public MAC addresses. And what's actually quite surprising here is that the IETF on the CFRG, they in fact warned about this uh, timing leak, but the designers didn't consider this serious enough. They thought, okay, this is a bit of a theoretical attack, um, and we don't think it actually leaks uh, the passphrase. Unfortunately, we can abuse this uh, side channel leak to do a dictionary attack, and I will now explain how this works. So our threat model here is that uh, either we can set up a rogue access point and induce the client into connecting to us, and we can also do it the other way around. We can act as a malicious client and try to attack the access point. So both of these threat models uh, are valid for our attack. So let's assume that uh, we are, for example, attacking the access point, and we're gonna assume that we can use uh, timing measurements to determine how many uh, iterations the access point needs to convert the passphrase into a curve on the point. In particular, I'm gonna spoof the client MAC address A, and I will measure that the access point needs two iterations. Then, of course, what I can do is I can uh, take my dictionary of passwords, I go through them, I execute this algorithm on my own computer, and I can then compare uh, my offline computations with the one I measured. And I can use this to exclude passwords. Unfortunately, making one single measurement is not enough to include, to exclude all possible passwords, so we need more information. In our example here, two passwords still remain possible, so how do we get more information to uniquely identify the password? Well, if we go back to our algorithm here, we can see that uh, the MAC address of the client influences the execution of this algorithm. So what we can do is we can simply spoof a different client MAC address and we effectively get an independent execution uh, of our algorithm. So to come back here, we can spoof uh, client MAC address B, we can again measure how many iterations does the target execute, we compare this to our offline results, and we can keep doing this until we uniquely uh, recover the password. To give you an idea about the complexity of this attack, if we want to brute force the ROCQ uh, password dump, we would need, on average, about 17 MAC addresses to uniquely determine uh, the password. 
And the takeaway message here is that the number of iterations that are executed for a set of MAC addresses forms a signature of the password. So one thing I haven't uh, touched on yet is, can we indeed measure these timing differences in practice? So here we did an experiment on a Raspberry Pi 1, and the reason why we picked a Raspberry Pi 1 is because its CPU is similar to a common home router and even some professional access points. And in this case, we attacked uh, the EPWD protocol. So this is, for example, used in, I would say, uh, about 3 to 4% of Ethereum networks. And here the attack was surprisingly effective when we make around 30 measurements per MAC address and we filter out uh, noise using Crosby's box test, uh, then 30 measurements is enough to recover the number of iterations. So that covers the case for EPWD, which was defined uh, already several years ago. When they standardized WPA3, they did realize that uh, they finally listened to the IETF on CRFRG, at least partly, and they included countermeasures. So what they did with WPA3, they tried to prevent timing leaks by always doing 40 iterations here and simply returning the first point that has a valid solution for the Y coordinate. Now that's not everything they did. On top of it, they also implemented uh, this in uh, blinded constant time to again try to prevent uh, side channel leaks. On top of that, once the real password uh, has been converted into a group element here, they will execute the extra iterations of these uh, total of 40 iterations using a random password. Again, this was done to defend against possible side channel leaks. Now, the question is, does that solve everything? Um, the answer is unfortunately uh, no. The reason why is if we take the resulting output here of the hash function, this needs to be truncated to the size of the prime P. So if we use a 256-bit uh, curve, the, 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 what is returned here are the first 256 bits uh, of the hash output. Now, the problem is, if we use brain pool curves, then there's actually a high likelihood that this output here, even when truncated, will still be bigger than the prime of the curve. And that would introduce a small theoretical base in the calculation, so we want to avoid that. And how did they decide to avoid this? Well, they simply used rejection sampling, sampling unincluded on if test here. So the question is, is it, are our side channels now really solved? And some of you may already see it. We have a problem here. This code may now be skipped. And the amount of times that this code is skipped depends on our sh shared uh, passphrase. Now, can we exploit this? Because we still, because the extra iterations are executed based on a random password. And the answer is yes, because the variance now depends on when the password element here was found. To illustrate this, if uh, our point P is found here in the first iteration, then all the extra iterations are performed on a random password and the variance is high. While if this is found in the very last iteration, then there are no extra iteration based on a random password and the variance is zero. On top of that, the average execution time uh, also depends on uh, in on which iteration the password uh, was found uh, as well. So both the variance and the average execution time still leak information about uh, the passphrase. And if we then again try to execute this uh, attack in practice on a Raspberry Pi against an open source WPA3 implementation, we notice that measuring this is a bit more difficult, but still by performing 300 measurements per MAC address, we can still determine, uh, we can still recover enough information to brute force uh, the MAC address. So that covers my part, and now EL will uh, talk about some more vulnerabilities. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we're going to talk about uh, cache attacks, and uh, we're going to use a relatively similar, similar threat model, but now we're only going to target the client. And here we're going to assume that we um, act like um, a malicious access point, 
And we're going to add the um, extra assumption that we are able to run some code on the client device. Now, this code is going to run in uh, user mode. It doesn't require any special privileges or permission. So basically, for example, any app that you download on your smartphone is, uh, might be sufficient. And it only uh, it's only required to be able to measure uh, such uh, microarchitectural side channels. So why do we need this? And if we want to be able to attack any uh, type of curves, the previous attack that was mentioned is not uh, applicable. The reason is that uh, with NIST, we use a prime number that is very, very close to a power of two. And then there's the negligible chance that we'll uh, see this uh, random uh, this, uh, rejection sampling. OK, so what can we do? We're now going to use a cache attack called flash and reload that is enables us to detect the exact point in time where a specific code line was executed. In this case, um, the code line that stores the uh, recovered point inside the variable. Now, this is going to happen in any end check that we make, and we want to know in which iteration does it happen. So in parallel, we're also going to monitor the call to the hash function, and this is supposed to give us a kind of uh, timer to, uh, that counts the different iterations. Now, as this type of attack is usually very noisy, uh, we'll, uh, we'll only want to recover one bit of information, if, uh, mainly if this uh, first iteration was successful or not. And to do it, we use uh, what's called a, a cache template attack. And we're going to uh, run several measurements. And we're going to give a specific uh, ID or number to each possible result. And then we can look at the distribution of the results that we get in both cases, if the first iteration was successful or not. And it is easy to see that those distributions are very distinct. And basically, uh, all we need is about 20 measurements and a very simple linear classifier to be able to leak this one bit of information. Now, we see that we are able to leak information on the password, both with cache attacks and with timing attacks. But the question is, can we actually exploit it to recover the original password? So to try to test this, what we did was to provide a, a full probabilistic analysis of the amount of different uh, measurements and computational steps that are required in order to recover the uh, unique password out of different size of uh, uh, dictionaries. We then continued to implement this type of attack using GPU code, and then uh, try to see how much money it will cost us on uh, AWS instances to actually recover the password. And we can see that, for example, for um, the Have I Been Pwned uh, database uh, of password, which include all of the password dumps ever um, leaked to the internet, it will cost us about uh, two cents in the worst case, which is the uh, recovering of a uh, password for the missed curves. And even if we go over a very large uh, password domain, like an eight symbol, it's still something that's uh, res relatively cheap for an attacker to do. And again, if this is your day job, you'll probably buy your own GPUs, and it will cost you much less than that. OK, so we are able to recover uh, passwords. And now we went ahead and tried to look at more implementation-specific vulnerabilities. And now this might come as a shock to some of you, but we were able to see several implementation that has bad randomness. Uh, for example, uh, one implementation uses the system time as the only entropy source. And the uh, interesting fact is, is that for WAP2, this doesn't really matter. It doesn't really affect the security. However, for WAP3, this is catastrophic and allows us to actually recover the password element. Another um, shocking uh, uh, finding is that uh, we were able to perform invalid curve attack. Several implementations didn't verify the points that uh, they received in the handshake. And this basically enabled us to uh, recover the session key and bypass the authentication. There are also several uh, Wi-Fi specific attacks. And the simplest one is denial of service. Um, uh, doing the entire 40 iteration is something that's very computationally uh, expensive. And it's relatively easy to saturate the access point CPU and then um, cause it to, respond, to stop responding. Uh, there is also the danger of downgrade attack. Basically, in transition mode, uh, both WP2 and WP3 network share the same password. Now, this is something that um, has been handled by the standard. And uh, during the handshake, this downgrade will be detected, and the connection will be dropped. However, this will uh, only happen after a partial um, uh, completion of the WP2 handshake. And this actually provides us all of the information that we need to do the um, previous uh, dictionary attack and uh, offline and recover the password. And there are also several issues with um, 
the support for multiple curves. It, it's relatively easy to downgrade the chosen curve, so we can uh, uh, force the, uh, the client and access point to use curves that are either uh, weaker in cryptographically or are easier to attack using side channels. So after we uh, had all of this finding, we started a very um, nice and interesting process of disclosure with the Wi-Fi Alliance. We tried to notify all of the involved parties as early as possible, because we wanted to be able to try to influence the WPS3 standard. The reaction was as followed. We started with a privately uh, backward compatible security guidelines and several patches that were distributed between the different vendors. After we uh, looked at those uh, patches, we were able to find the brain pool side channel that was uh, shown previously. And this led to another uh, round of disclosure uh, that um, also includes several uh, patches. And uh, recently, about uh, two months ago, they, were, uh, they updated the guidelines and they now prohibit the use of brain, brain pool uh, curves altogether. And if we look at the latest uh, guidelines and the way that uh, we try to mitigate this type of attacks, so there are se uh, several guidelines that we try to, uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance provides to the different vendors. And one of the guidelines is uh, very simple and straightforward. Please implement uh, your code without any side channels. Uh, another guideline says that if in some case the WPS3 uh, transition mode does not meet the security requirements, then please separate uh, your passwords. And in the end, what they say is that if you fail to implement those guidelines, this might uh, uh, result in an attack and a compromise of the network. Uh, what I am not sure uh, is how this can be checked. Uh, for me, at least, it's not very easy to find side channels in uh, different code for uh, many different implementations, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is going to be part of the certification process or not. Even after all of this, there are still some fundamental issues that were not solved. And the main one is, of course, this is something, this kind of protocol is very hard to implement in constant time without any side channels. And on lightweight devices, doing those fault iteration is something that might be too costly. And we actually saw several implementations that didn't do the whole 40 um, iterations. Fortunately, uh, the IEEE has now um, updated a draft of the standard with several of, the, of our, uh, our recommendations. The most important one is to exclude the MAC addresses from the hash to curve calculation altogether and incorporate it in the later part of the uh, protocol. This allows the uh, password element to be computed offline, and it does not only make the protocol much safer, it also makes it much more, more efficient to implement. Moreover, um, the switch from this hash to curve that we've shown, that was called hunting and packing, to a constant time hash to curve solution. They explicitly forbid the use of uh, many different uh, uh, groups, and uh, they uh, have now a position how to prevent uh, a cryptographic uh, group downgrade attack. Um, there are some remaining issues in the new standard, and I think maybe the most notable one is that unlike many modern protocols, they do not hash in the transcript of the messages and incorporate it in the key derivation. This uh, raises many issues. It makes it much, ha much harder to uh, actually uh, write a formal proof of the protocol, and it uh, raises many risks of uh, implementation issues. For example, the way that they prevent the uh, cryptographic group downgrade attack is now dependent on different checks that the programmer should uh, make, and if we uh, simply incorporate the transcript in the key derivation, it will be made implicitly. Uh, another problem is the way uh, the downgrade to WP, uh, WPA2. This is something that's currently not addressed in the standard at all. There is a possible solution, which we call uh, trust on first use, which basically means if I connect to a network and I see that it's WPA3, I will never agree to try to connect it with, uh, with WP2, uh, WPA2 protocol. This is actually done by both Android and the network manager of Linux. But as long as there's one single device that doesn't follow these guidelines, we can always attack it and use it for the offline uh, brute force attack. Another uh, remaining issue is that those uh, new solutions are not backward compatible. This question, how can they be um, adopted today? Maybe there will be WPS 3.1, uh, but we're not clear how the Wi-Fi Alliance is going to handle this and how they can to prevent, uh, for example, the risk for downgrade attack to the current original WPS 3. After all this, you might ask yourself, should we use WPS 3? The question for right now, I think, is yes. WA2 is trivial to attack, so anything else is probably better. And in conclusion, we can say, WPS3 is vulnerable to side channel attacks, 
that li might lead to password recovery. The current countermeasures are very costly and very hard to implement. There is a new draft uh, for, uh, that solves many of the issues. We, are not, uh, we don't know if it's going to be adopted or not. But maybe most importantly, those issues could and should have been avoided in the first place. If the standardization process would have been more inclusive, uh, for example, we've just seen um, one example with uh, 5G, and there's the TLS 1.3 uh, uh, process, we think that we could have avoided, avoided all of these different problems. And in that, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, we have time for one question. It's more of a request than a question. Um, so currently CFRG is running a PAKE selection process. Um, I don't think side channel analysis uh, has really been considered as a first class security concern yet in the selection. So please would you guys get involved and give us some of your cycles and take a look at the proposals. Yeah, we'll be more than happy to do it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know that they're also using the hash to uh, curve draft on there yeah. they're really looking at, but yeah, not the handshake itself maybe. Yeah, exactly, yeah. thank you. Great, well, thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's really, really cool work. And then now uh, we're going to move on to the third talk of the session, which is going to be on navigation security. So lo really looking forward to the talk. And not GPS, actually, but on Galileo security. So Tomer is going to give the talk. And all yours. All right, so that's my slide. Nope. Good, so this is a joint work with a long list of capable people whose names are projected here, so I won't read them because I'll probably butcher their names in the native language. And the talk is about Galileo authentication. Galileo, and for those who don't know, is a global navigation satellite system, or GNSS, operated by the European Union. And even if you're not <clears throat> familiar with the term GNSS, there's at least one such system that you are uh, familiar with, and that is the US GPS. So bluntly put, Galileo is the European GPS. And in fact, there are four deployed um, systems like that. The US GPS, the Russian GLONASS, Chinese Beidou, and the European Galileo. In addition to two regional systems, the Indian Navic and the Japanese Michibiki. And I think that in this educated crowd, um, everyone knows the principles of GPS navigation. You stand somewhere with your cell phone. Uh, there are satellites floating around the Earth, uh, sending their location periodically, and a reference time for when the message was sent. Your phone collects mes messages like that. Um, it records the time in which the message was received. And once it has enough of those, uh, for, in the case of satellite navigation, it substitutes the values that it has into these equations, which solving them then gives you your location. And we all use GNSS. I came here using, uh, by using Google Maps. Uh, many cars come equipped with satellite onboard satellite navigation systems. And uh, for my marathons, I uh, use devices like this to track my progress. But actually, GNSS is not only a consumer's technology. It is heavily used in infrastructure, uh, in aviation, in marine navigation, synchronizing power grids, um, doing things in the financial sector. It is really a part of the modern day infrastructure, which is why it's so shocking how easy it is to spoof signals in GNSS. In preparing this presentation about a week ago, I uh, searched YouTube for GPS spoofing and filtered out all results older than one week. Still, there are hundreds of videos explaining how to spoof GNSS data. And what I find uh, most insulting in this is the that the motivation doesn't seem to be hijacking an airplane or crashing down the power grid. It is to cheat in a game played on your cell phone called Pokemon Go. <laughs> so what we have is a critical piece of infrastructure, originally designed by the US military, that can be spoofed by people playing Pokemon Go. Now, there's no disrespect towards these people. I am one of them. I play Pokemon Go, and I spoof Genesis data. <laughs> but I still find the risk uh, unacceptable. And so do the people at the Galileo project 
at the European Commission, which is why they decided that their service will offer public authentication. And that means that when you use uh, your device to uh, determine your location based on Galileo satellites, you will have assurance that this information is true. So what we need is a system, right? We want an open system. Anyone uh, can start their cell phone, get the data, and start navigating. But we, on we want only legitimate satellites to be able to send the signatures for this data. So that obviously puts us in the domain of public key cryptography. But actually, that comes with a problem. Due to the frequency in which GNSS operates, um, the bandwidth is extremely limited. It's between 50 bits per second and 200 bits per second. Uh, it's 120 bits per second in Galileo. And if you need context for this uh, number, about 20 years ago, when I was 16 and I got my first home modem, it was 43 times faster than this, 20 years ago. And um, on top of that, due to legacy support, the part allocated for authentication in Galileo is only 40 bits every other second or uh, 20 bits per second on average. So public key cryptography is out of the question because the signatures would just be too long. And that doesn't leave us too many options, right? We only have two types. So we probably should be using symmetric key cryptography. But this also still comes with problems. Symmetric key cryptography is called that way because the keys to all parties are the same, or parties are indistinguishable with respect to their uh, role in the protocol. So suppose we use the same secret key for all receivers. If I receive a message, which I can verify using this key, it means that I can also sign another message and send it to someone else who won't be able to distinguish between me as a sender and a legitimate sender. So using the same key for all receivers is, also, is not an option. How about using a different key for each uh, user? Well, first, it's unclear how we would do the key exchange here, right? What, I'll just talk to the satellite, tell him, okay, we'll run a Diffie-Hellman dear satellite. So not that. And even if there was a way to disseminate these keys, uh, there, there's still the problem that the satellite would have to sign the same information using different keys and send them to all the receivers on a channel that I've already told you that is extremely limited which leaves us with the question of what um, can we still do. So I will now present the system developed at KU Leuven, and just to clarify, I'm not, uh, this is not a proposal. This is the system that Galileo will be using. It has been approved on all levels, uh, already implemented, and testing should commence sometime soon. I'm not exactly sure when. And the system is based on a key hierarchy. I use the pyramid because I'm not sure in the hierarchy whether the bottom of the pyramid is the top or the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, we have several layers of keys, and I'll go into each of them. Hopefully, uh, then you'll understand how the system works. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the root of a Merkel tree. A Merkel tree, for those not familiar with the concept, and this is a bit awkward to explain what Merkel trees are when Ralph Merkel is in the audience. I hope I do it well. Um, a Merkel tree is a way to provide a short commitment to multiple values. What you do is put the values you want to commit to in the leaves, and in the first step, you hash each of them separately. That's this layer. And then you hash um, two values at a time to create a tree-like structure. Then the commitment is the root of this tree. Now I want to authenticate a value. Uh, sorry, I want to reveal one of the commitments. So I provide the value I want to reveal, along with the authentication path, which are the nodes uh, with a circle around them. And what the verifier does is to um, hash this value, and they get this value, and then they hash these two values, and they slowly rebuild the tree and compare the root they, they get with the commitment they received. And if they match, it means that the value uh, sent was part of the original commitment. Otherwise, it means that someone found a collision in a collision-free hash function. Also, this doesn't expose any other value because let's say that I, you have this value. Going backwards in the tree means that you can find a pre-image in a pre-image resistant hash function, which we assume to be hard. In our case, what we put in the leaves are public keys 
not too many of them, and those will be used throughout the lifetime of the system, which should work for, I don't know, 10, 20 years. And we really hope that we would never need to replace any of those keys, but just in case, we have a few others. The root of the tree is hard-coded into your device. So what we have, again, is a Merkle uh, tree used to authenticate a public key, and the public key is used to verify a digital signature for a root key. I know that I said that uh, there's no room in this protocol for um, digital signatures. Well, I lied. Um, as long as you don't have to append a digital signature to every message you send, we can, once in a while, if, uh, infrequently sending a new root key, we can probably fit in a digital signature. And I say probably, but we know that we can because uh, well, we're testing the system now. What is a root key? A root key is the end of a hash chain. The hash chain is built by selecting a secret key and hashing it, and then the output is hashed again, and each output is hashed, and we have uh, now a chain of hashes, and the last value in this chain is the root key. The root key uh, can be made public because it's the output of hash function, so you cannot go back in this chain. And it is authenticated using a digital signature. Then the root key is used to authenticate an effective key. An effective key is another um, link in this chain. And I'll tell you in two slides what's effective about it. Meanwhile, I'll, sh I'll tell you that having a, one of those keys, let's say the one before last, it's easy to verify that it's correct by hashing it once. If it maps to the root key that we've authenticated using a digital signature, it means that it was sent by the original uh, generator of the chain because no one else can find a pre-image. But for me, as the person who generated the chain, it's easy to provide pre-images. I just hash forward. And finally, the effective key or an effective key is used to authenticate our payload, the message or the location data M. And for that, we use the Tesla protocol developed by Perig and others in 2005. And it was, works in the following way. The time is split into discrete components, and I guess you can't see it, but um, it's I minus one, I, I plus one, etc. Each link in the chain is associated with one time frame, and that's um, the, an effective key is the key associated with what we think of as now. Later, this key will no longer be effective, it would be obsolete, and we will have another effective key. Now, how do we authenticate a message here? In the first time frame, and every subsequent time frame, uh, we get three data items. We get M, or I'll call it M minus one, which is the location data for that time frame, and a message authentication code, which is the symmetric key analog of a digital signature. So a MAC of uh, the location data, MI minus one, with the effective key, KI minus one. Now, I don't have this key, so I can't check the MAC. I take these two values and just store them somewhere for a later use. The third data item is KR, the root key, which, as I said, is uh, verified by means of a digital signature. So far, I don't have my location, and I haven't authenticated any location. That's fine. Moving on to the next time step, I, again I get the location data, MI, and the message authentication code, MI, um, sorry, the message authentication code for MI using the effective key, KI. And I don't, I can't verify that, so I just store it. I also get KI minus one. That's an obsolete key that was effective in the previous time frame. And what I do is to hash it and see if it matches a key that I've already authenticated, in this case, KR. If it does, I fetch the two data items from the previous time frame, and I can now check the MAC. If it checks out, I know that I can trust MI minus one that was authenticated using this MAC. Moving on to the next time frame, the same thing happens three data items, MI plus one and MAC of MI plus one with the effective key. I store those and I get KI, an obsolete key. KI is hashed and if the output matches KI minus one, KI minus one I know to be uh, authentic. 
So now I fetch these two data items for the previous time frame, and I authenticate them. And this is done uh, over and over until the chain is exhausted. A chain should last for about three months, uh, and then it's replaced. And that's how our authentication protocol works. What we see here um, is, an, is an authentication scheme that authenticates values in a, with a certain delay. In this example, the delay is one time frame. But uh, the Galileo protocol actually allows um, different uh, time frames, so it supports multiple um, delays, up to five minutes for different use cases. And this is it. Then we also had to make some changes to the original protocol. If we would use it in the naive way, we would need a hash chain uh, for each satellite, right? Um, we, need, we have a constellation of about 24 satellites. So 24 chains, uh, each of them requiring a different root key, means also that we, each of them requires a different digital signature. And that would uh, very quickly eat all of our bandwidth. So instead, we found a way to use one chain in all satellites. Another change we made is that the, in generating the hash chain, it's not only the effective key that is uh, given as an input, we also add an I value. This is um, a reference to the time frame in which this key will be effective. And it's like salt uh, in password hashing for that particular key. And an alpha value, which is sold for the entire chain. And also some random stuff, because why not? Um, this is an actual system, and it should be working for a really long time. And we don't know whether SHA-256 will be secure for the entire duration uh, of the system. So for each of the primitives we use, we have several options. Um, for hashing, we use SHA-256 but we also support uh, SHA-3-224 and SHA-3-256. For MAC, MACing, we use HMAC SHA-256, but we also support CMAC AES. And for digital signatures, we use uh, ECDSA with these curves. All of these are um, parameters you get from the satellite in the header of the message telling you which primitives are being used for uh, that particular instance. Our security parameters, um, unfortunately, even after building this complicated system with the key hierarchy, uh, we can't fit all the data we need to send into a message, so we have to truncate some values, and I hope this is not too outrageous. Well, it should be, and I hope to survive this. We truncate the effective keys to 90, uh, somewhere between 90 and 128 bits, and we truncate the message authentication codes to somewhere between 10 and 32 bits. Now, um, I don't recommend using max of uh, 10 bits, not even 32 bits, but in our particular use case, we have a security analysis showing why this is secure. I don't think I have time to talk about it, but um, maybe in the questions phase. So, to conclude, Galileo will be using, uh, sorry, Galileo will be offering uh, a way to authenticate publicly the navigation data you receive from it, so that you can play Pokemon Go without fearing that someone will cheat and steal your Pokemon gym. Thank you. Very nice. We have time for questions. Uh, let me ask one question. So uh, these kind of systems, they're very difficult to change. Once you, once, once you deploy them, they're going to be out there for decades. So aren't you worried about quantum attacks? Like in 30 years, 40 years, ECDSA, who knows where it's gonna be? So I agree. Um, these decisions are made above my pay grade. Um, we actually discussed the possibility uh, to include, so I, this would probably, uh, the issue would be here in the digital signatures. I know that they've considered adding uh, post-quantum digital signatures as supported mechanism and decided not to. And again, I don't get this, a vote in this. Uh -huh. Yeah, please. Okay, I, maybe I misunderstood something. It sounded to me like you have relying on very long chains and you only signed the very first uh, uh, message. What happens to a, a GNSS system which is turned off uh, for the first half month, 
then comes on and then starts hearing it. How does it? How is it going to get the verified case of I values? Yeah. So the root key is sent uh, constantly by the satellite. As so the um, we have time for a slightly longer question. Oh, yeah. Each packet you receive from the satellite has the, this information that I just explained and some management um, stuff, admin, admin values. One of those admin values are the, is the root key and its digital signature. So if you get this key, for example, you also know um, what your uh, time reference is. You just hash it multiple times and see that it matches the root key that you also received from the satellite with the digital okay. signature. So how long is the chain actually? Is it like a million hashes or? It's about, well, it's three months, um, about three time, three keys every 30 seconds. Someone here is probably a better mathematician than I am, but yeah. uh, three, um, six keys every minute for three months. Okay, so, okay, yes, you have a huge number of hashes, okay. So how do you prevent an attacker from taking the signal from the satellite, delaying it, amplifying it slightly, and then the receiver locks onto the amplified signal and can't decode the original signal. It's authentic, but it's been delayed, so now there's a shift in the, in the position from the satellite. But the, yes. So first of all, this system does not prevent someone from just jamming the signal, okay? That's not what we offer here. Uh, the receiver know, has a loose time synchronization with the satellite, so it knows which key, um, since the time reference is part of the key, you won't be able to use it after the time frame ended. So if you're using the rapid authentication, you can delay it by uh, about 10 seconds, or maybe even less. Satellite navigation is uh, even less accurate than that, so that's not really a problem. And beyond that, the satellite can detect that the message has arrived too late and cannot be used. You don't see it. I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, a microsecond delay is, a, is 100 meters. A millisecond delay is several kilometers. So I'm not sure about these numbers, possibly. Um, well, I don't have this slide here. The error accumulated when the satellite sends you the signal is anyway larger than this. Uh, sat satellite navigation is less accurate than what we think. Um, what we use, again, not my field, been explained that, is uh, assisted satellite navigation. So your precision comes from the assistance part anyway and not from the satellite. But, but I think that the cryptography is not designed to, de to defend against those kinds of attacks. I mean, this, there are other mechanisms in the systems, or more physical mechanisms that are designed to, de to de defend against that. Against uh, jamming, but you Not just jamming, replaying. He's referring to a replaying attack. Where you well, no, uh, so the cryptography does prevent replaying. As long, well, so with, within the delay of the loose time synchronization you have with the satellite. Okay, well, this is a good topic for an offline, yeah. offline discussion. Fantastic, thank you. This has been fantastic. I really, really enjoyed the talk. All right, so we have a break coming. Just before we break, a quick announcement. There's a clicker that's been found. So if anybody wants a clicker, there'll be a clicker up here on the, on the, on the stage. Uh, and so we have a break now, and we're going to resume at 11 a.m.